This is Get Real with Bob and Stacy, the show that helps you learn about the mortgage and real estate markets, get the inside scoop from their expert list of guests, and have some fun along the way. Now, here's Bob Callagher and Stacy Alcorn. Thanks for joining us. You're listening to Get Real with Bob and Stacy. You're joining us for our first Leaders and Legends segment today. Our guest joining us by phone today is Danielle Tate. She's the founder of MissNowMrs.com and author of The Elegant Entrepreneur. Welcome to the show, Danielle. Thanks for having me. So be- beyond being an entrepreneur and a book writer, um, Danielle is also a wife, a mother, a Pilates devotee, and of course a name change expert in her spare time. Can you tell us why you wrote your book, Elegant Entrepreneur, The Female Founder's Guide to Starting and Growing Your First Company? Sure. I am very much an accidental entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. I spent the first 20 years of my life intending to be a doctor. And so I had this great idea for a business, but zero business background and even fewer computer skills. So I self-educated through all sorts of business books. And while I learned things, I never found a book that talked to me like an intelligent woman and didn't assume that I had an MBA. And Mm -hmm. so Elegant Entrepreneur is very much the book that I always wished for. One that gave 12 steps from idea to exit, but also talked about how it felt to be living those steps and provided insights from all sorts of female founders from the United States, like like, um, Barbara Corcoran from Shark Tank, from Donna Harris from 1776, The Global Incubator. And so... I wrote it to get more women to start up and scale up their companies. So how can listeners tell if their idea is worthy enough to start a business? That's a great question and a question that every person out there has. And so I created something called the Innovation Gauntlet, and it's on, cha- it's on page six, not chapter six, mm-hmm. and it's a series of questions to, to ask yourself. Is your idea truly innovative? Is there a large enough market? And are you providing enough value that people would switch from whatever they're using now to, to your product or your solution are some of the questions you should ask yourself. And all of those questions are interesting, but the one thing that I wonder is, don't you think some people just don't, are not cut out for entrepreneurship? That's true. Entrepreneurship isn't for everyone. And so that very much ties into the the how does it feel and what is it like to be an entrepreneur component of my book. I want women to really understand the process of building a company, how it feels, and what the lifestyle is. So they make a decision eyes wide open and don't do something they won't enjoy. Hmm, Interesting. So how would you suggest someone, let's just say that somebody's listening today, they have a great idea, they have a full-time job, bills to pay. How do they leap into entrepreneurship? Well, I would tell them not to leap. I would tell them to tiptoe. So when I, when I founded Miss Now Misses, I didn't quit my job as a uh, sales rep. I sold cancer diagnostic equipment. Mm-hmm. I used evenings, weekends, and very unfun holidays to do the initial research to understand how large the market was and what solutions were available. So I would tell that listener, figure out who your, who your market is and how many people there are and what they're looking for and what they're willing to pay. It's not fun. It's not glamorous. But the information that you collect will help you better understand whether you should make a, a leap, um, as you say, or if you should continue to tiptoe a little bit further to, to further validate before making a change. Okay, that's great. And I know at age 25, you bootstrapped your Miss Now Misses website you ended up growing it into a multi-million dollar enterprise. My question is, there's so many ways to start a business. So, for example, some people reading the book might want to bootstrap. Others might want to go out, find venture capital money or loan money in order to grow big faster. Do you offer insight to, to entrepreneurs on which direction they should go as, in regards yes, to that? Yes, the funding chapter is one of the lengthier chapters because there are so many options. Mm-hmm. Um, one that you didn't mention is... Um, crowdsourcing right. or crowdfunding mm-hmm. your, your, your startup. And so things like Kickstarter are talked about in the book as well. I think the type of funding you look into is very dependent on your opportunity. If you have a niche or a passion, it's something that I think you should at least initially self-fund. But if you are going after an opportunity that's exploding and you need to scale and grab market share, then outside funding might be a better fit for what you're doing. 
Okay. And I know you talk in the book about like basically what the life of an entrepreneur looks like. Can you describe that? So if somebody's listening right now, and let's just say you're working a nine to five job, I think life is just very different as an entrepreneur. How would you say it's different? So I get out of bed every day and know that when I have a good idea, and I will have a good idea, it's part of how I structure my day, Mm -hmm. I need to implement that and I have the power to implement that to grow my business. So instead of having an idea for a company you work for and, you know, telling your boss and hoping it filters up and knowing that most likely it won't, you have the instant gratification of of watching that idea happen and seeing the positive outcome from it. So if that makes you excited and happy, then entrepreneurship is something that you should consider. If that scares you or sounds terrible, then conversely, nine to five might be a better fit. Right. Or if you don't like, like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches <laughs> going three months Bologna. without a paycheck. Uh, if I, that, you can be smart about yeah. that. Like, for mm-hmm. example, um, when most of our friends were buying their first homes, my mm-hmm. husband and I elected to stay in our tiny little 800-square-foot condo because I was just launching Miss Now Misses. Mm-hmm. So by not taking on a huge mortgage, we didn't have to eat ramen. We were just smart right. in other ways. So, mm-hmm. yes, there was ramen on occasion, but I tried to map it out and save accordingly. So instead of, you know, the tiptoe effect, instead of just jumping in and then figuring it right. out. And you bring up a great point about your husband. I think if you want to be an entrepreneur, it's like a family sport. Like your whole family kind of needs to buy into what you're about to do. That's very true. And I've seen it both ways. Sometimes the stability of having a partner in corporate America with health insurance and steady income mm-hmm. is great but oftentimes they don't understand uh, the amount of time and effort that you must dedicate to your startup. Conversely, my husband is an entrepreneur as well, and so he completely gets what I'm doing, and we try to time our individual startups and you know project rollouts so they don't coincide. It's like having kids, people time when they get pets and children. Uh, companies can be like that if you're both entrepreneurs. Yeah, that's interesting. So, Before we go further, I do have some more questions. What is the best way for people to buy the book? So the book is available as a paperback or Kindle download on Amazon. Just uh, go on Amazon and type in Elegant Entrepreneur and you'll find me. Okay. And it is Elegant Entrepreneur. It is the Female Founder's Guide to Starting and Growing Your First Company. Where your husband is also an entrepreneur, do you think that there are differences between men and women who are launching a business in an entrepreneurial field? Yes, that's a great question. There are differences, and I think co-founded teams of both men and women are are perfect because we balance each other out. Mm -hmm. Um, What I have seen in my own uh, entrepreneurial career as well as friends and and other uh, colleagues is that women tend to be slightly more risk-adverse which is fantastic once you've launched a company. We're less likely to jump into partnerships. We're not going to launch a half-baked product. Uh, On the flip side, I think that that contributes to the sticky floor. So in corporate America, there's the glass ceiling. And in entrepreneurship, there's the sticky floor for women because we can think of all the reasons why we shouldn't launch a company or why it will fail. And Mm -hmm. so we need to sort of get over ourselves and get out there a little bit more, which is part of the reason I wrote the book. And I love the fact that not only have you written a book, you're an entrepreneur, you're a wife, you're a mom, you do Pilates. How do you find balance or is balance even possible as an entrepreneur? So I think the beauty of being an entrepreneur is you can define success and balance on your own terms. For a very long time, I thought, you know, like being a doctor, being a cardiologist was success for me. And so when that didn't happen, it it took me a little while to – bounce back. And so now success for me, as I define it, is being an amazing wife, an amazing mom, an amazing CEO, an amazing daughter, and an amazing friend. That's a whole lot of amazing in a lot of buckets. And Mm -hmm. so what I do is I pinpoint the one most important thing I can do in all of those buckets and make sure it gets done. And I schedule it on my calendar so it happens. And when I look back over the months, I've done the, the biggest things possible for all of those people and all of those things in my life. And that makes me feel successful. Wow. So what would you say has been your biggest challenge in growing your own business? 
My biggest challenge uh, was early on we had a, a number of copycat competitors. Mm -hmm. And competition was expected, but I'm a nice Methodist girl from Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. so I really didn't think people would just steal all of my forms and information. And so making the decision to do um, battle uh, legally and uh, testifying in in federal court, eight months pregnant, was by, by far one of the most uh, challenging things I've done as an entrepreneur. Wow, that's interesting. And do you offer advice to entrepreneurs or somebody just starting an entrepreneurial business on what it is they can do? I think if you're just launching in to an entrepreneurial career, even if you have a full-time job and you're doing it at night and weekends, there are a lot of days that it's just so hard that you just want to give up and go back to your paycheck. Do you offer any advice on how to get past those days so that you can just keep moving forward for the sake of your business? Sure. One of my best pieces of advice sounds very simple, and it's have a good idea daily. Hmm. So you may be struggling, your company may be struggling, but if you can focus on, I need to have a good idea that I can implement today or this week or this month, and then put it into action, you're going to have something positive to focus on, and you're going to be doing something that helps grow your company instead of wallowing in the worry. Hmm. So that's something that I very much tell every entrepreneur that asks me, what should I do? Hmm. No wallowing in the worry. And how important do you think an entrepreneur's network is, getting out there and just meeting people? Networks are incredibly important and something I did a very poor job of using mm -hmm. uh, early as an entrepreneur. I just never felt like I, w I qualified for the title. I was like, oh, I have a small business. I run a website and sort of hid behind that because I didn't have an MBA or a business background. But once I figured out that, yeah, I am an entrepreneur and I, I need to find people like me and talk to them and find people who understand me, um, the connections and the advice and just sort of the the sense of camaraderie was, was just so beneficial and something that I think is, is vital to being a successful entrepreneur. And you mentioned the fact that you didn't have an MBA. I, I look at many of the successful entrepreneurs, men and women, people that have built multi-million dollar businesses and empires. Many of them are college dropouts even. Like it doesn't seem like an MBA is that important or even a degree is that important to building a successful business. What are your thoughts? Those are my thoughts. Entrepreneurship is sort of a great equalizer, mm -hmm. and in that vein, that's why I wrote this book. And I have a Kickstarter starting on Tuesday to fund the audiobook, wow. and in that way, I can give it to aspiring female founders around the world who don't have access to traditional education or MBAs or not even Amazon. Mm -hmm. So they can download the book on their phone and listen to it and build companies that change their lives and their communities and their world economies. Wow. Did you have any mentors along the way? I also did a really poor job of finding mentors. <laughs> <laughs> so that is something that I suggest to, to new entrepreneurs. However, you can't just run up to someone and be like, oh, will you be my mentor? Yep. The people you want to be your mentors are inundated. Mm -hmm. So what I tell new entrepreneurs is think of the one question, like the utmost question you need answered to move forward in a decision or in, your, in building your business and find the perfect person, the ultimate person or persons to ask that question. Mm -hmm. And ask that question, and you might find that that, that turns into – uh, a mentor relationship. Yes, and I I wrote a blog about this one time about the fact that it drives me crazy when people ask me, they'll come up and say, "Will you be my mentor?" Like I've been mentored by Tony Robbins, Warren Buffett, like people that I've never met because you just read their content, you follow what they're doing. Like it doesn't need to be a formalized mentor relationship where you're meeting with somebody once a week. You can have guides that really you're not taking up any of their time. You're just learning from them. I agree. So uh, any last words of advice for somebody listening today that is contemplating going out on their own, starting their own business? Understand the steps to business. Make sure you have a valid idea with a, a large market. And don't be afraid of failure. I think our culture is very tied up in, in success. Well, you know what? You have to fail to succeed. I failed to be a doctor. I failed to change my name. 
and they turned into an entrepreneur with a name change service that, that makes quite a bit of money. So hmm. don't be afraid of failure. Don't embrace failure, but learn from it and look at it as an opportunity that, that may turn into a company. Yeah, that's awesome. And find mm-hmm. solutions, like just the fact that you found a solution to the fact that you were terrible, like me, at changing your name. Um, well, Stacey, you've only had three years, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I think we should just mention the website, because who, who even knew that this existed? That's crazy. That really is a good Miss now com for any women that recently married in the last decade that have not <laughs> yet changed uh-huh. their name. Or you can also now go to com. so... If you're actually it's get your name back. Oh, it is get it? your name back. I like that. That's awesome. Get your name back dot com. So if you're looking to change back from uh, your change back to your original name, uh, we are lucky to say that Danielle Tate has it covered. So um, whether you're changing your name or if you're an entrepreneur, check out her book, Elegant Entrepreneur, the female founder's guide to starting and growing your first company. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Danielle. That's going to do it for this segment. We're going to take a quick break for commercials. We'll be back with more Get Real after this.